This is 9-11 Freefall. Gentlemen, welcome to another episode of 9-11 Freefall. I am your spooktacular host, Andrew Steele, and tonight I'll be joined by Craig McKee. We're going to be talking about uh, an article of his where he highlights the recent trend in zombie movies, and we're going to be talking about horror movies overall, because it is almost Halloween, it's my favorite holiday, and... Uh, fiction, as most people know, are, is a reflection of what's going on in a society at the time. And right now, in our time, in our society, we're dealing with the fact that someone somewhere made a decision to bring down the World Trade Center towers, the Twin Towers and World Trade Center Building 7, and controlled demolitions. And now, like some episode of The Twilight Zone, there's a few of us who are sane, who are pointing to Building 7 and saying, no, that can't happen unless you have preset explosives inside, are being treated like the crazy people. All right, By the media, by the government, which is becoming more and more isolated as more and more people wake up to the scientific evidence. So we're going to be talking about what is the latest trend in our pop culture. We're going to be having a little bit of fun tonight, a little bit different than normal 9-11 Freefall episodes. Normally I bring on the experts, the scientists, talking about nanothermite, freefall acceleration, demolition squibs below the collapse line of the trade towers. That's the normal uh, topic of discussion on this show. We're going to be talking about 9-11 tonight, so it's not going to be that much different, but... You know, why are we getting so many zombie movies lately? What are they trying to tell us about our society, uh, how people perceive themselves in relation to the bigger world? And what about shows like American Horror Story? What do they say about American society? About some of the underlying madness uh, beneath the surface here as we try to move forward business as usual, pretending nothing is amiss, even though something is terribly amiss. Because... <laughs> Fire cannot bring down a steel frame high-rise. Never has before 9-11, never has after 9-11. Only happened on that day with Building 7. But now we're expected to swallow this lie and people are holding on to this lie. People are closely guarding it. All right, we've moseyed into America and everything seems idyllic on the outside, but something, there's an underlying evil there. And I'm not saying the American people are evil, I'm not saying America as a whole is, but there's an underlying evil in this post-9-11 world because we all know the truth. Deep down, somewhere inside us, that telltale heart is beating, saying, reinvestigate, 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 driving the murderers insane. So we're going to be going on with that Halloween theme tonight. Craig's an interesting guy. I love talking to him, and I don't even think... This conversation captures just how funny he is, if you actually get to know him and uh, some of his interesting uh, insights and things that he brings up. So I'll be looking forward to playing that for you. Uh, I'm just going to go over some news in the first 15 minutes here of this show. Uh, I'm going to, like I said, try to stick to our Halloween theme tonight. I don't get an opportunity to have a theme like this very often, I guess just once a year, and I didn't even do it last year. I think I had Tony Zambodi on to talk about the omissions in the uh, NIST uh, report the from the Unbuilding 7. So we're going to start having a little bit more fun here, even though it's a serious topic. Uh, there was an article that was making its rounds all over social media earlier this week. Uh, someone sent it to me, and it was claiming that Trump came out, Donald Trump... Speaking of uh, American Horror Story and Halloween, I guess the presidential debate is playing on the day that I record this. Uh, but I guess this article was saying that Donald Trump came out and called for a new investigation into 9-11, uh, allegedly cited some uh, uh, how two planes can't knock down three buildings. It's a hoax. It's not a real article. The whole thing was circulated. And, it, you know, I could see how people at first glance would think this was a real article. But when you actually look at other headlines that were on the same news site, you see this is a satire news site. So as my public service for 9-11 Truth Movement, that is not a real article. Trump has not called for a new investigation into 9-11. But it is interesting to see 
the latest kerfluffle that he's gotten himself into with the Bush family over debate about whether or not George Bush really protected us on 9-11 to see how that has brought 9-11 even more to the forefront. I mean, 9-11 is always in the background of everything that goes on now. We know that. It's in the background of legislation they try to pass, uh, stealing our civil liberties, uh, trying to make us accept this post-9-11 world and all of the uh, soul-crushing changes that have come to this society as a result of it. It's kind of like a deep, dark demon possessing the souls of our legislators and bureaucrats, whispering in their ear, take more rights, take more rights. Fire can bring down a 47-story steel frame high-rise. Of course it can. Why not? Uh All right? So it's always there in the background, but now it's out in the foreground in this debate over something that, you know, even if you buy the official story, I would actually agree with Trump on, uh, that uh, if you buy the official story, well, Bush really didn't make us safe. He played golf for however many months he was president while warnings were coming in. But that's a whole other issue. Here you go, though. People are looking to bring this issue more out into discussion, uh, using this as a springboard to talk about the fact that 105 feet of free fall of Building 7 is impossible unless you have preset explosives. And that's a good thing. But we got to be careful about about our hope in people running for president. Our hope that because somebody says a particular thing on on one issue or uh, gets himself into a scuffle with the Bushes about whether Bush really protected us, whether or not this person is actually going to endorse a a position that is true but has also been made controversial by this media establishment. And everything that I've heard of Trump uh, in discussing 9-11 sounds like he has bought the official story hook, line, and sinker. So I don't want to pop people's balloons here, but let's face reality. All right, Trump, at least is at this point uh, in everything he said, is not going to save you. Just like Bernie Sanders is not going to save you. I've played those clips here on this show of Bernie Sanders when he was confronted on C-SPAN's Washington Journal and asked about Building 7. And he doesn't even address the scientific evidence. All he can say about it is, uh, oh, no, it was, a, it was an Al-Qaeda plot. I don't believe in a conspiracy on 9-11. It was an up, up, up by Al-Qaeda. All right, that's Bernie Sanders. That's your great hope on, on the left right there, buying the official story hook, line, and sinker. So politicians are not going to save us unless we hold their feet to the fire. So by default, actually, the only people that are going to save us are the American people. That's all it's ever been. All right, politicians, all they do is react. They react. They put their finger up and see which way the wind's blowing and, and go in that direction. All right. And in the discussion tonight with Craig, we actually bring up superheroes, too. This idea that someone's going to come and fix everything. That Superman's going to swoop in from the sky and repair all of our problems for us. That it's going to be somebody else. We don't have to take any personal responsibility. It's going to be some fictional hero that's just going to save the day. Well, that's not the case in real life, folks. The case in real life is we inherit whatever world we create for ourselves. And right now we're creating a world that uh, will allow a few people in power to lie, to deny science reality, uh, to push an agenda, to push this post-9-11 world and all of the money that gets made from it and all the consequences that we have to bear as people. And that is not a good thing. So I'm not against political outreach whatsoever, but we have to be realistic with uh, the situation and uh, you know who politicians are inherently at their core. And we got to put some effort forth ourselves to make sure that they feel pain. And I don't mean when I say feel pain, uh, violence or threats or anything like that, except for maybe threat of embarrassment uh, for being confronted with this issue in public, maybe threat of being voted out of office because enough people are woken up to this uh, topic or to this issue and uh, say they will vote against that person for somebody that is more open to a 9-11 investigation. This is the kind of stuff that is going to save us, not some guy appearing on the scene saying, I will reinvestigate 9-11, even though no one's holding my feet to the fire, because that person is never going to come, folks. So we got to make it happen ourselves. All right, uh, I just want to highlight an article that is currently up at ae911truth.org. 
It is the latest in Franchure's articles called Why Do Good People Become Silent or Worse About 9-11? And you want to talk about a good Halloween theme. Uh, part of this article talks about the Nazis. Uh, talk about uh, uh, pushing a big lie and swaying an entire public to go along with a wrong agenda. This pretty much lays it out. A big historical example of that here not too long ago in our history either i mean if you think about it 100 years it's it's not even been 100 years what has it been like 60 years or something it was the 40s it was 60 or 70 years that's not a long time in human history we haven't come that far since then uh and so if you go to the end of this article it's got an interesting uh section called projection scapegoating and healing and I'm, I don't know if I'm going to have time to read the whole thing, but <clears throat> just to give you a quick excerpt, which you can read in this article at AE911truth.org, uh, begins, Projection is a psychological defense mechanism that we all use from time to time. Our shadow, the negative tendencies we are unaware that we possess, is unconsciously projected onto another person or even onto a whole group of people. Our shadow can be understood metaphorically as our personal demons or as a hidden pool of poisons. When our defenses are weakened, for one reason or another, these inner poisons float to the surface of our awareness, throwing our emotional equilibrium off balance because they do not fit our self-image of who we are. This can create unbearable emotional pain. To relieve ourselves of this pain, we unconsciously project these poisons, these demons, these traits onto others. So to summarize... When we unconsciously harbor unacceptable emotions, traits, or impulses, we defend ourselves, our identity, by projecting these emotions, traits, or impulses onto another person or even the entire an entire group of people. This dynamic is a psychological origin of scapegoating, a violent form of projection, indeed a physical, emotional, or spiritual sacrifice of the scapegoated person or group. That is interesting. I never knew that's where that came from. But I'm sure that we can all think back to somebody that demonstrates this dynamic even something within ourselves where we project it onto others so when you think about 9-11 9-11 truth all these comments about that the corporate media uh talks about people like us well you know a good case could be made maybe these people think that way about themselves so maybe it's something that they uh should reflect on next time they look in the mirror All right, before I play my interview with Craig McKee, we're going to do what we do every week. We're going to take our 10 seconds of silence to remember the victims of 9-11 and their families and all the people who died in the wars that followed 9-11. We'll do that starting now. And that's 10 seconds. It's hard for us here to believe what we're reporting to you, but it does seem to be a fact. When this emergency first began, radio and television was advising people to stay inside, behind locked doors for safety. Well, that situation has now changed. We're able to report a definite course of action for you. Civil defense machinery has been organized to provide rescue stations with food, shelter, medical treatment, and protection by armed National Guardsmen. Stay tuned to the broadcasting stations in your local area for this list of rescue stations. This list will be repeated throughout our news coverage. Look for the name of the rescue station nearest you and make your way to that location as soon as possible. Since convening, this conference of the Presidential Cabinet, the FBI, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the CIA, has not produced any public information. Why are space experts being consulted about an earthbound emergency? So far... All the betting on the answer to that question centers on the recent Explorer satellite shot to Venus. That satellite, you'll recall, started back to Earth, but never got here. That's the space vehicle which orbited Venus and then was purposely destroyed by NASA when scientists discovered it was carrying a mysterious high-level radiation with it. Could that radiation be somehow responsible for the wholesale murders we're now suffering? Uh, You're coming from a meeting regarding the explosion of the Venus probe, is that right? Uh, Yes, yes, that was the uh, subject of the meeting. You feel there is a connection between this and the phenomenon? There's a definite connection, a definite connection. In other words, you feel that the radiation on the Venus probe is enough to cause these mutations? There was a very high degree of radiation. Just a minute, Uh, uh, I'm not sure that that's certain at all. I don't think that has been a logical explanation that we have at this time. In other words, it is the military's viewpoint that the radiation is not the cause of the mutation. 
Craig McKee has been a journalist in Montreal for 23 years, and he's covered news and entertainment. He's won eight provincial and national weekly newspaper awards. He's the writer over at Truth and Shadows. He's one of my favorite guests, and we'll be talking tonight about a number of things. Craig, welcome back to 9-11 Freefall. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for having me. So here we go. It's a special edition of 9-11 Freefall, the spooktacular edition, if I really want to get that corny. And uh, it's it's going to be airing pretty close to Halloween night here. And I never have done a Halloween episode just because in the, it's a serious topic we cover and we, we always keep focus of that. Uh, however, this is the favorite holiday of the year, so I'm going to take advantage. Uh, you've got an article up at Truth and Shadows. It might be a, a month or so old uh, talking about zombies. Uh, well, tell us about your zombie article. Well, it, uh, it's something that I had in mind to write for a quite a long time because I, I had really noticed over the last few years just how many uh, movies and television shows have been made that focus on uh, not only zombies, um, which is the, the zombie genre seems to just sort of burst into something huge, but more specifically uh, viruses and contagions and this sort of thing. Um, you know, in the last 10 years, it's just kind of insane how many films have been made on this topic, and there, there are more coming all the time. And uh, in, in perhaps even more in the last maybe five or six years, it's happened with television as well. Uh, just, it's just a, an incredible proliferation of these, uh, movies and TV shows that deal with this idea of some kind of virus that uh, either is like uh, the movie Contagion, Steven Soderbergh movie, uh, where it's just literally people getting sick and dying. Um, but there's other ones where some type of virus causes people to either turn into zombies or turn into vampires or, you know, all sorts of different things. And uh, I just, it just sort of, I came to, to conclude that, that it was just, it was too becoming too common for it simply to be something that was just popular. I, I sort of sensed that there was something else going on. And so that's why I, I, I did write this article and uh, kind of chronicled uh, some of what, you know, what we've been seeing and what, um, like even things like, even ones that were made going back 20 or 25 years ago, uh, I'm thinking of, of like The Stand, Stephen King, uh, novel was turned into a miniseries back in the in the early 90s and then there was the movie 12 monkeys with brad pitt and bruce willis that was i think 95 and both of those have been remade uh in the last few years and it just seems like not only are they coming out with new movies and new tv shows that have to do with viruses all the time but they're even reaching back and grabbing the old ones and redoing those uh, it seems like uh, I can't imagine that the, the movie-going public has just got that much of an appetite for for movies about people getting viruses and, and getting sick. It, it doesn't seem like a, a natural sort of a thing. So it seems to me like that there's something else going on, and it seems like uh, it's it's almost as if the the, the films and the and the TV shows are are kind of uh, you know painting a picture of a of a future where, you know, really survival is, is, is going to be the goal, not, you know, not cooperating, not making a, finding a way to make a better world, but, but simply trying to survive, you know, at the expense of your neighbor or whatever. And so many of these films, you know, the little, the little, uh, the slogans that they have on the posters are things like, you know, f fear thy neighbor and, you know, nobody is safe. And and here's why we're talking about this tonight, folks. I mean, other than it being Halloween and it's fun to talk about horror movies, but uh, why do we study fiction? And when you're in high school and they make you read Shakespeare and they make you read the old Greek classics, Antigone and, uh, and the others, why do they make you read that? Why do they make you read about uh, Odysseus and his odyssey through uh, the, the land of the dead and with the Cyclops? Because it's a reflection on the human spirit. It's a reflection of the society that is creating this fiction 
too. And so we'll be exploring some of that tonight as well. And what are these movies trying to tell us about ourselves? And I think that's an important thing to explore because I watch movies a lot. Whenever I have downtime, I go on Netflix. It's like one of the greatest things. Uh, eight bucks a month, pretty much that's my entertainment. That's how I save so much money. And, and, and like, I can watch certain movies and realize what this movie, whether intentional or not, is trying to tell us about the world. I'm going to use a case in point. I watched this movie, I don't know, probably uh, last winter. It was a Stephen King movie called A Good Marriage. Now, uh, quick warning to anybody that's listening, if you haven't watched it yet and you want to be absolutely surprised by everything, I am going to spoil the hell out of it for you. But the whole premise of it is is that you have a husband and a wife. They're getting older. The husband's at retirement age. And they have two kids. A uh, daughter's getting married. The son is making a success for himself in some kind of business. And the father's retiring. And in the background of the beginning of the story, there's a serial killer running rampant killing women. Right? Long story short, while the father is away on some coin collecting venture in another town, the wife discovers through accident and then you know following some leads within the house she discovers that her husband is the serial killer and she uh accidentally leaves out evidence that she was on his computer and he finds out about it and the way he confronts her about it is very casual and he says oh you know i know you know about it honey and uh you know i don't worry i would never hurt you i love you and i know that you will never tell anybody about it because and he mentions the daughter's marriage coming up and the son's success in business and how that would destroy all of them and destroy all of their lives so he's pretty confident that she's not going to say a, a darn word about it and i'm watching this and i'm thinking while this plot line is really uh, painting a picture of what we're facing here in the post-9-11 world, there's a lot of people, no doubt, in Congress, people in government, people who know about the controlled demolition evidence, people who know uh, what is really going on uh, in the wake of this catalyzing event that we've based so much of our foreign and domestic policy on, who know the truth about it but are saying nothing. And people wonder why. Why do they keep this secret? And they always assign some deep and shadowy you know, uh, system of control to blame for this. But, uh, I mean, there is a system of control, but a lot of it is these kind of personal concerns and also concerns about what it would do to the country. That's why I always stress, try to stress that it's uh, good for America to reveal this. But people are worried. People are afraid of all that we've invested into the 9-11 lie. And this may be one of the reasons that they don't come forward. People don't want to think about it. People don't want to face it. So like this wife in that movie dealing with the fact that her husband is a serial killer and saying, okay, just don't do it again. I personally believe just from what I've observed and just a lot of America is awake to the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence but has kind of taken this attitude because they don't feel like they can do anything about it. And so it's kind of become this bizarre horror movie like scenario that we're in where we're, everybody is aware of this terrible thing that was done but very few are doing something to step forward and, and do something about it. And so, I mean, you want to talk about the real American horror story of the show that by that name, we're facing it right now. What do you think about that, Craig? That's that's interesting. I have not seen that that film. In fact, I haven't even heard of it. So, I, no, the first thing I'm going to do is, is go look for that. Um, it's interesting. I mean, uh, you know, I know so many people who, well, who I have, I guess, tried to to wake up on this subject. Um, and they're, they're so resistant and I, I, I find myself analyzing in my own head what that resistance is. Uh, is it a case of they know about it or they understand, they believe it, but it just, it's uncomfortable. So they, you know, they kind of block it out or, you know, sometimes I think that consciously they actually think it's crazy, but because they, it just, it just seems, the denial seems too kind of thick, I guess. Um, so can people sort of talk themselves into thinking it's crazy on a conscious level and, and sort of under the surface, they, they they kind of fear that there is actually something to it. You know, I'm not sure. I mean, I think some people definitely just, they'll say, yeah, I, I totally believe you're, you know, you're, you're probably right, but you know, they feel powerless about it. Um, and so they just kind of want to, yeah, they want to shut it out. 
you know, going back to another horror show, I mentioned it before, the American Horror Story show. I went, th- there was a period like last summer where I had three people tell me that I need to watch American Horror Story all separately. So I took that as a sign that I need to sit down and watch this thing. And I like it. I like the, uh, uh, not so much the first season, but maybe the next couple seasons were really good. And what I got from it was that there is some symbolism here. There is, and, I, and I, you can actually get this off of Wikipedia, where the first season's theme is infidelity, the second season's is about sanity and control, the third season is about oppression, and the fourth season is about discrimination. And these are all aspects that make up any civilization, the undercurrent, especially in the last season where you have it set against the backdrop of the 50s, but it's based around a freak show and what some of these people have to go through in terms of the discrimination. But what gets me about it is a certain set of characters where the uh, it seems like a perfect rich family, but the kid is a, a killer and shows that underlying issue, that underlying problem beneath all of this prosperity and wealth that we, we've had over the years, a certain kind of madness that is beneath it. And you can see it reflected in, in this. People are more afraid of public ridicule or, um, I don't know, whatever, or what it would do to the country, economics, people who are making money off of the post-9-11 world would rather than having a new investigation just keep the the lie going. Um, I think that this is, you know, someday that maybe this period in history will be portrayed in some kind of horror story and maybe the horrors of the big lie will be manifested as some kind of monster form or, or something in order to reflect what was going on in this society. But, I mean, there there is more to these movies and, than what meets the eye. And getting back to your article... Uh, this whole notion about zombies, you know, I've often asked this. I've noticed this with movies and TV now. What seems to be the most prolific stuff? It's the zombie movies. It's also the superhero movies. And I wonder myself if that's a reflection of how people feel about themselves and how people feel about the greater world. Do people feel like they are the only real person, that they're the only alive person? Or maybe people are doing some kind of wish fulfillment through the superhero movies because they wish that they could do more against the the face of everything that's going on here in the post-9-11 world. Now, these are just my thoughts. I I can't reflect on, on what the writer's actually intention. This is my own interpretation. This is why literature and fiction and everything is fun. Um, but what do you think about that? Well, I think, you know, the superhero thing is kind of interesting. I'm not... Um I guess on one level, it, it just seems to become huge business, and so it's going to keep going as long as it's huge business. But it seems to almost, you know, fit into the idea of pe- people waiting for some outside force to kind of fix everything. Um, and it's it's what I've always found funny is that in movies, people love to see the one guy that goes against the system who you know, basically saves everything, but he, you know, everybody's against him, but he sticks to his guns and he ends up being right. People love that in movies, but they don't love it in real life. And I find there's an irony there. Um, you know, the idea of somebody being, you know, being different or being, uh, which is what I, one of the, yeah, one of the themes of that, of that uh, freak show season definitely was, if you're different, then society will see you as a freak. Basically, but you know, there's so many movies where there's a hero, and the hero is somebody that kind of goes against all odds. But in real life, uh, you know that that hero, you there is not, there isn't usually a hero. It's just, it's you know, we're the ones that have to fix things. So I think, uh, and, and with the zombies, you know, it's funny. The zombie zombies kind of became popular. I don't know about this was the first zombie movies, but it became more more common starting with uh, 1968, Night of the Living Dead. George Romero is the director of that. And he was kind of known as the sort of the king of the, the zombie genre. And he did a series of them. And in fact, he did one called Dawn of the Dead in, in I think, 78. Um, and it's interesting to see the zombies in that movie compared to the zombies that we see in movies and TV today. Then he used it as a sort of a social satire. So the zombies were kind of symbolic of uh, 
of commercial, not only commercialism, but but consumer consumer society. And he even had a very funny image of of people because it takes place in a mall. These, these people are hiding out in a mall, and it's got zombies in it. And you just see the people, the zombies trying to get into the store with, when the doors are closed, and they're they keep sort of bumping into the into the glass. And it's it's a very kind of a funny image that makes fun of of our consum- of us as consumers, you know, desperate to get into the store to, to consume. Um, and the, the zombies were very slow moving and comical in that movie. But the zombies today are not like that at all. The zombies, they move fast and they're scary. I remember, uh, I'm just thinking back to my, because I, I took film, uh, film studies at university quite a long time ago. And um, I had a professor who, uh, who I, I took a, a course on horror films from, a guy named Robin Wood, who actually wrote a, a really uh, important book uh, about Alfred Hitchcock, one of the best books on Alfred Hitchcock. Anyway, his take on horror films was that the monster, whatever the monster is, is representative of something in society that something in our culture that we can't sort of incorporate into our something that that's something other starting, I guess, you know, back around the time of Hitchcock's psycho, that was really when the monster was something within the, within the nuclear family. Whereas before, so it was something, it was, the threat was from within, in other words. But before that, most of the, uh, the horror movies dealt literally with monsters, like you know, Frankenstein or Creature from the Black Lagoon or something like that. But it was always something coming from the outside. So it, was, it wasn't saying, you know, our, our society is horrific in some way. It was saying that we're being threatened by something outside that's horrific. Um, but Psycho kind of was the beginning of the change of all that. And you know what? Before uh, Psycho and everything, what was the big deal was giant monsters, and what we usually created them was some kind of nuclear testing, the evils of science gone awry. Uh, Godzilla was caused by the A-bomb, and you can see this reflects a lot of the concerns of the people at the time where they were worried about nuclear war and what this would lead to with the invention of this thing. And so the, those fears were manifested as a giant monster, a giant literal monster. And I'm going to tell you something, folks, since we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, on this theme here tonight of Halloween, talking about horror movies in relation to society. And of course, 9-11 plays all into that in modern society. But, uh, whenever you have a dream, you know, they sell these dream books and how to interpret your dreams based on symbols. Um, those books are, are nonsense. Um, the best thing to do if you ever have a nightmare is just ask yourself, you know, what kind of feeling did you have when you woke up? And when you think of each symbol, what does that symbol mean to you and it usually will manifest something that's going on in your life so that's my quick psychology tip here on 9-11 free fall but I got this feeling that it somehow it goes beyond dreams that it goes into the imaginations of writers things that they're picking up uh, in society whether they know it or not and that they're reflecting as these monsters that they use to try to scare us or in the stories that they create to try to get us all excited and uh, paying our money for our tickets you know, something I noticed the other day, because there was this whole big thing about the fact that uh, we just had Back to the Future Day happen. I guess in Back to the Future 2, he went to October 20-something in the year 2015, and they, somebody took note of that and was taking note of how many predictions in that movie came true. Uh, I guess not a lot of them did, but I don't have a hoverboard, and uh, I guess uh, and we don't have that uh, automatically fitting clothing that is in that movie. Uh, but what I noticed, though, and, and I think I'm right on this, I haven't scientifically analyzed this, it's just an observation, is that you don't really have a lot of movies, new movies coming out, that portray uh, a hopeful future, that portray a utopian world of like several decades away. Now, part of that might be because we don't have the year 2000, that nice, big, round, exciting number that we had in the later part of the 20th century to look forward to. But I also noticed that in a lot of science fiction movies now are, are embracing the idea of parallel universe, a different universe where something went slightly different or where people's lives are slightly different based off of a choice that they made. And I got thinking about this and I thought, is this a reflection of a lack of hope in society? I mean, I'm not trying to be depressing or anything, but instead of looking to a grand new future, 
Uh, it seems like if you're if you're reflecting on a different universe where different choices were made, is there something more that we regret in our society? Looking back, something we wish we could change in our present rather than looking to the future? I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, I think that's a really important question because uh, the future that we are seeing portrayed in, in movies today is is pretty bleak. It's pretty apocalyptic. Whether it's a zombie apocalypse or just a regular apocalypse, it's it's pretty bleak. Um, and I guess then one one question we could ask is that does that reflect people's anxiety about the future, or does it in some way contribute to that anxiety? Um, is it is is are are there is there an effort underway to to make us feel more alienated and uncertain about the future? Um, you know, if you go back to the 1960s, you know, when Star Trek started, uh, you know, it was, I think it was a very optimistic time. Um, and certainly the future portrayed in, in, in Star Trek is a, is a positive future because, you know, everybody sort of comes together and there's no more, you know, discrimination or theoretically, um, at least among humans. Although the, ir- the ironic thing about that is that the uh, the original first officer of the Enterprise was going to be a woman, and and then you know the network decided that's not going to fly. That's that's too far ahead of that's too far ahead of our time. So they changed that and made it made it a Vulcan instead. But uh, you know it seems to me this this is why I think I think that you know some people are just sort of following the trend, but you know I, I mean it's a I think I think it's pretty certain i I think it's certain anyway that uh there's a lot of influence in hollywood coming from you know the cia from the pentagon from you know other powerful forces so if if there's a certain uh reality that uh that they want us to to see or a future they want us to get used to uh or changes to our society that they want us to get used to so that when they actually when they actually happen, that we kind of accept them. Um, you know, this I, this does not seem far fetched uh, to me at all. You know, I don't know. Um, it's hard to know because it's hard to speculate on on what's going on inside people's heads, or if if they are trying to tell you something, if they're doing it on purpose. You know, I used to write fiction, and I wrote a book actually in college. I never got it published. It was a horror. Well, it was a, like a superhero horror novel, kind of a mix. And I just started to notice that, like, each character and situation, and it was like a reflection of something that was going on in my life. And I didn't realize it until I stepped back and saw this. And I think this, I mean, this happens sometimes too. Um, but then you look at things like that Pearl Harbor movie uh, being just, you know, it's like weird. How did that come out a few months before 9-11? And all you can do is really speculate, you know. There's no way to know this, and people can drive themselves nuts trying to uh, trying to figure this out or or whatever, that's why we stick to just what we can prove. Um, But what gets me is this whole notion of society being at the breaking point, like you're talking about with the zombie movies. And, you know, I don't think that there's going to be a a literal zombie apocalypse. It's funny, though, is that I have people I know who are more concerned about a hypothetical, impossible zombie apocalypse than the fact that scientific evidence proves that the World Trade Centers were brought down and controlled demolitions on 9-11 and the media and the government just stays silent and complicit on it. To me, that's more alarming, but I actually have people, know people who have made contingency plans for if there's a, a zombie apocalypse. And I just, I just kind of them left shaking my head. But at the same time, it makes you wonder because, like, okay, I'll tell you a quick story, and I don't know if I've ever even told this story on the air before. I've told it to a lot of people, but I, used, I worked at a casino once as a cashier, and... Uh, there was something you could take money out on your credit card. You had to have your driver's license in order to do it because we had to enter it in the computer. And this woman came up with her credit card. Well, this woman didn't have her driver's license. So she's kind of begging me because she wants to get money off of her credit card to go gamble with. And I'm saying, you know, I'm sorry, I got to enter information in the computer and you don't have it. So I can't do it. Well, her husband comes up. He opens his wallet and says, well, why don't you use my driver's license? Now, anybody with any common sense will tell you that you can't use one person's driver's license with another person's credit card. They all got to have the same names and match up. He didn't really care about showing me his driver's license. What he was doing is he started to open his uh, wallet to show his police badge to me. 
So I'm supposed to be all impressed and see his police badge and be like, oh, right away, sir. Okay, great. Well, at the same time, though, even if I was that gullible and, and stupid, uh, I still got to enter in the information in the computer. If it doesn't match up, the computer's going to automatically know. So I said, you know, that that's nice and everything, but I, I still can't do it. So this became an escalated issue. Supervisor got involved. I had to step aside. Supervisor's dealing with them. And the cop said at the end of this, he didn't get what he wanted because it was, it was actually physically impossible or it was uh, computer impossible to, to do this. But the cop said to my supervisor, well, I'll remember this when you know, we're handing out favors to people coming out of the casino, implying that um, you know they're going to keep a closer watch on the casino for speeders and drunks coming out of it. And I thought, wow, this cop is willing to throw his weight around and make these kind of threats so his spoiled wife can gamble. What would he do if there was really a real emergency situation? How would that badge be getting thrown around then? How would he be abusing his power then if it was a, instead of a question of gambling, if it was a question of survival or keeping society together or getting the last bit of supplies off of a shelf at a store? And, it, you know, it's scary because I saw this in Uzbekistan when I was a Peace Corps volunteer. Cops would take bribes from cab drivers. It was so routine. It was just look, they looked very matter-of-fact as they did it. And see, that's what frightens me. Now, do I think, you know, know if a situation like that, that kind of disastrous situation is going to uh, strike us anytime soon? I don't know. But anything can happen, even out of the clear blue. You never know. There could be an earthquake tomorrow in a, a certain area that's devastating and knocks out uh, society in a particular area of the, the country for a while. And I see these things, these behaviors from like that police officer. I see people's behaviors on Black Friday when they step over each other for a $2 waffle maker. And I find it frightening um, to think what would happen if it was actually over something real. And maybe that is what the zombie movies are reflecting. Or, or they're, or they're either reflecting it, or they're, they're sort of uh, conditioning us uh, to have to have a certain mindset. I mean, one of the things that that uh, you kind of sort of hinted at a little bit, I think that that goes along with a lot of these films, particularly the zombie films, is the whole idea of martial law and uh, you know people's rights being uh, basically going out the window. In other words. Uh, you know, we we don't we have no time for for rights now. You know, it's we're it's survival time, and so we're we're seeing all of these depictions of society where when when all hell starts breaking loose, you know, basically we have we lose all our rights and we we hand them over to the to the police or to the army or whatever. And uh, you know that you see that in all the zombie movies. There's the the sequel to the Walking Dead series that that's set in Los Angeles. And, you know, they, they sort of quarantine a whole part of the city. And, uh, you know, army people, you know, shooting shooting people, even if they're not sure that they're actually zombies. You know, it's kind of, uh, I think that, that kind of, that's kind of alarming. That's one of the whole, I guess, things about predictive programming is that it seems to be sort of conditioning us to accept the inevitability of, of certain changes to how we're going to live. Um, I mean, certainly there are tons of shows and movies that show how surveillance is becoming completely accepted. You know, shows where like um, the criminal minds where, you know, everything is all a couple of quick, you know, keystrokes and, and you figured out everything about the person and you, you know, you know where they are because you're watching them on uh, CCTV TV cameras and all that. So people are getting very used to the idea that, well, we're going to be surveilled all the time. It's just that's just kind of a normal part of life. I know that TV and entertainment is used a, as a weapon against certain groups. Uh, we talked about this one time when you were on the show with the Law & Order episode where the killer or the suspected killer, I think it ended up being somebody else for a surprise twist at the end, but the the, they had a 9-11 truther on there, and he was this crazy conspiracy theorist living in a warehouse full of booby traps. He was dangerous and just completely delusional, and you know that was intentional. Or at least it reflects the writer's perception of people like us. And why do they have that perception? Because, you know, when I look at the architects and engineers, all the 
people who are very certified and very qualified to be talking about this evidence. You know, I don't see delusional people living in a warehouse with booby traps. But this is what how media and entertainment is being used against us and against any kind of group that doesn't follow the status quo of whatever agenda is being pushed on us. And you know that they do use this stuff to push agendas on us. You can see that there's even been news articles about that, about how the White House has asked writers to you know, push this certain thing or that certain thing and how 24 was used as a uh, pep rally for the post-9-11 response to uh, the quote-unquote terrorists. Like, I, I've seen this. Um, you know, we, this show focuses on 9-11, but I've looked into JFK and stuff, and the movie Parkland. Uh, if nobody's ever seen this, entertain yourselves and watch this. I think it's hilarious. Like, they'll have the scene where the uh, local coroner wants to do the autopsy there in Dallas, and the agent wants to get the body back on the airplane and send it back to Washington before he can do it. And anybody who's researched that issue knows that that is a, uh, a big sticking point that people debate about and people who think that there was a, a bigger uh, plot against JFK say that that was part of it. You know, um, But in this movie, the way it's portrayed is the doctor who wants to keep the body in Dallas, he's a squirrely looking little peon guy and this agent is a handsome young man and he basically tells this doctor to shut up essentially like putting him in his place and it's like the whole movie is like this and what gets me too is abraham zapruder begs the uh whoever bought it there either like time life i think bought the the zapruder film afterwards but in the movie he begs them not to show the public like you can't show this this is a man dying here please don't show people it's like give me a break already or you can go on uh, YouTube, and in, in YouTube, it's called The Trial of Lee Harvey Oswald, and this is a clever little piece of propaganda. It's a 1970s TV movie that shows you uh, what would have happened if Lee Harvey Oswald went on trial, so it's supposedly historically accurate up to the point where Jack Ruby shoots him. And, uh, and then it goes into fiction, but what would have actually happened? And it's like such sloppy propaganda, and, uh, and they portray... Like, Oswald is this complete loony, like, guy just, like, screaming and freaking out. And then while he's talking to his wife, his wife is looking at a picture or a, a video of JFK on the TV set. And she's got this admiration and almost kind of lust in her eyes for it. And then Oswald catches her and she gets, she's all kind of humbly... Yeah, puts her head down again, almost like, oh, he's jealous because his wife is pining after the president or something. And, like, you see the the way this actor portrays him, and then you actually look at the clips of Oswald as he's being arrested, and it's, like, not the same person. I mean, you know, actually, Oswald seemed pretty calm for a guy that was, uh, you know, being being arrested for this major crime here. Um, so, yeah, it's just, like, the sloppiest piece of propaganda. Another good one is the movie about Woodrow Wilson from the 1940s. It is so terrible, this movie. Uh, I, I don't even know. I mean, maybe this would have worked in 1940s America. I don't know. But just the, the way they portray it, uh, the way they have him, after he hears about the Zimmerman Telegraph telling the German ambassador to shut up and sit down every time this ambassador tries to talk, and he just puts him right in his place. Like, no conversation ever plays out like that. Anybody who's ever argued knows that. You, you, you war game a conversation in your mind with someone you don't like. And you're like, I'm going to tell him this and that. And he's like, but it never works out the way you intend it to because other people don't play in the script that you have in your head, you know. But that's the way this Wilson movie played it out. Like, just he could do no wrong and he puts everybody in their place. And So I know this goes on and sometimes they even commission these movies, from what I understand, um, to solidify official stories and, and whatnot. What do you think of all that? Oh, I, I, I definitely do. I mean, I don't know. You know, I don't think, it, obviously, the the parkland movie was made to coincide with the 50th anniversary um and it, it, you know it's i i think you can just look at certain like for instance the, the movie argo with uh, ben affleck um when i when that first came out and it, it was right in the midst of all this discussion about whether you know the u.s should attack iran and, and you know they're trying to get nuclear weapons and all this sort of thing um my first thought was there's no way that that movie just happened to be made now and unrelated to what's going on. There's no way. And I found out later that in fact, it's that the CIA was involved in making Argo. So 
I kind of thought like, right, that's what I thought, you know, um, I'm glad that turned out to be true. Um, so, and, and, you know, you'll notice now there's a lot of stuff about, about Russia, you know, yeah. like suddenly Putin is, 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 you know, considered a big threat. And we have this show called the Americans about KGB agents, uh, planted in, in, in the U S and, you know, living as Americans, right in the midst of, you know, of all of us, it's just kind of like, is that, is that coming out now just because somebody thought, Hey, that would be a good, that would be an exciting series. Or, or is there more to it? I don't know, but it's, it, you know, the, the timing is, is interesting. And even the new uh, Spielberg movie, uh, a bridge of spies. Um, I haven't seen it, so I can't really say much about it, but it seems to get into the Russian, uh, angle uh pretty heavy again well i noticed i was uh i was catching up a couple of months ago with the arrow show green arrow because i like that i was watching the flash and i guess the flash spun off from green arrow so i'm like i should watch green arrow so i was watching like the first two seasons and there's an episode where they're in russia and there's like this very blatant comment by somebody they encounter about how terrible russia is to free speech and and whatnot and so i paused it and i'm like when did the show air okay it was like november of i want to say 2013 or something then i looked up like what was going on in the news at that time and i typed in russia and it's like uh you know u.s draws a red line in syria with russia and i'm just like oh okay that's why that's in there you know um, yeah, you're right. It's like the, it's like, I mean, you, and the thing is, is that all of these independent, supposedly independent artistic writers that are so brilliant and imaginative and so free spirited and rebellious, you know, and they're working in Hollywood, they can't all feel the same way on all of these issues. There has to be writers that know about the controlled demolition evidence. If everything was just on the up and up, you wouldn't have this kind of uniform opinion being expressed by all of our entertainment. You would have differences of opinion. You would have you would have eventually have like some kind of uh, you know some kind of radical person out there uh, expressing radical views in a particular show, and maybe they just don't think it would sell or something. But there's no reason to insert the politics in it then if you're worried about controversy. So they insert the politics in it, and the only people that it alienates are people that actually know what's going on. Everybody else just kind of gets their worldview sold to them through the behavior and and uh, actions of these characters at Bull, and they're just really actors playing a, a part on TV. Uh, wow. Yeah, I completely agree, and I think you could use you can you could look at the, at the at the news media too as kind of a parallel thing because you know we all are are quite comfortable saying that. Well, the you know the news media is completely controlled, and and you know they're completely just all the, they'll only sell the official story of all of these various events, and you can't you know you can't get away with saying nine eleven is an inside job in the New York Times, or uh, and that's so that's sort of an interesting parallel because you know we're talking about would a filmmaker actually consciously do this or not consciously consciously do this, you know. With journalists as well, you would you wouldn't have a uniformity of opinion, or you wouldn't think you'd have a uniformity of opinion on something like uh, controlled demolition. But and yet, you know, in in the in the mainstream media, there really is practically unanimity about it. So, you know, you can look as you know you can look at why that is much in the same way I think you could look at why that's true in Hollywood. Um, you know, is it that people are told you must not write about this or is it a, is it more subtle than that that where journalists um you know they kind of understand what what the bounds of of acceptability are and they and they know that if they want to keep their jobs and if they want to move up the ladder that they sort of incorporate this this view of how the world works um you know i think it's a combination of of all of those things I think there's definitely well, I, some journalists that know what's going on, and there are some filmmakers that know know what's going on. Well, I've talked to somebody who's uh, actually worked in the newsroom at one of our major networks, and I was talking to him for quite a while, and he was explaining that you only uh, get promoted up if you tow the company line and tow whatever agenda is being pushed at any given time. 
Um, and I think that's how they use it. I think that the people who just are determined to be famous, determined to be that big name, will will say whatever they have to say, do whatever they have to do to get there. You know, you just ever get watching something and you don't even know why you're watching it. It's completely not up your alley, but you just find yourself sucked in for no reason. I was watching the Natalie Wood story a couple of days ago. It's like a three-hour movie about Natalie Wood. And uh, she was the actress that... Uh, fell off the boat. With, she was on the boat with Robert Wagner and Christopher Walken. And just all of this insight into her life and Hollywood and people concerned about their careers rising or falling when they're already gazillionaires and have all this money and have nice houses and stuff, but they're worried that they're not in the limelight anymore. And I thought, how wonderful it is it is it that I'm in my mid-30s right now. I don't care about any of that stuff. I have this little podcast here. What great freedom there is. And the people like me, are never going to be in Hollywood. <laughs> the people like me are never going to get on TV because we're not going to work that hard to get there. We're just going to do our own thing here on the Internet and not have to crawl or beg to some censor. I mean, you know, you watch shows like American Idol, all it is is about groveling to power, basically making a fool of yourself so that you can achieve some little bit of stardom. And I think this is how they uh, control everybody. This is how they, they do it with their minds. It's not even... Uh, conspiratorial it's just they present this image of what being a success is in the society and they know a certain percentage of the population are going to buy it and reach for it and those are the people they're going to quote unquote get ahead and then everybody else who's in a supportive position is just going to kind of enjoy their little position and not uh not rock the boat so it's something that it, it's that that it's worth uh it's worth following it's worth all of us kind of keeping an eye on and watching and seeing, you know, what we're seeing in the movie theaters and on television, what is it saying about our, about our society and what, and is it something that is, you know, uh, reflecting where people are or is it something that's influencing where people are? Um, and just, just, I guess, look, be, look beyond the surface level of it as entertainment, just the way so many of us do, you know, like second nature when we're looking at, at mainstream media uh, accounts of things like 9-11. We, we immediately suspect that. I think it would be worth uh, doing the same thing with, uh, with our entertainment because I think there's a lot to be learned there. Craig McKee, thanks for coming on 9-11 Freefall. My pleasure. Thanks again. This program airs every Thursday night on No Lies Radio at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. You can also download MP3s of this show from the Internet Archive by going to 911freefall.com. This is Andy Steele saying have a great week and good luck.